This is your tech news briefing for Monday, February 6th. I'm Zoe Thomas for The Wall Street Journal. As artificial intelligence technologies become a bigger part of our everyday lives, a lot of people are asking, how much can we trust it? That question is one that WSJ reporter Eric Neeler and researcher and inventor Rama Chalapa try to answer in their book titled, appropriately enough, Can We Trust AI? In a recent live Q&A, Eric and Rama looked at one particular area where trust in AI plays a big role, healthcare. They spoke with WSJ live journalism news editor Sarah Castellanos about it. Here are highlights from their conversation. So welcome to both of you. It's so great to have you here. So AI is being experimented with across so many sectors to you know varying degrees of success. You guys mention a number of examples in your book. What are some of the most cutting edge uses of AI in healthcare specifically today? Eric, do you want to start? Sure. Um, AI really feeds on large amounts of data and um, healthcare and medicine generate a lot of data uh, in the sense of screens of the body, uh, tumor biopsies, um, photographs of you know, skin lesions, these sorts of things, uh, data from patient records in the hospital, vital signs, a real endless list of information that is collected about a patient's health. So um, people who are able to combine uh, AI and, and medicine are right on this cutting edge of being able to take a computer algorithm with a large amount of data to look for patterns that otherwise just would be impossible or just take too long to figure out. So that's what we're looking at right now. And it really cuts across a lot of fields in medicine. So tell us a bit about the sort of the AI and um, COVID example here. I mean, Eric, it seems like it was used, but potentially AI was used, but potentially not to great lengths or to great yeah. effects, right? Right. And so what, what was happening is at the time, um, uh, doctors and um, computer scientists and data engineers were working together. Is there a way to predict hospitalization for COVID when a patient comes in? If they show these sorts of vital signs, these sorts of symptoms, can we say that this person, um, you know, either has COVID, how they're going to, um, how long it's going to take for them to recover, what kind of hospitalization rates should we prepare for a big surge of patients, you know, uh, if we're seeing these sorts of things in our in the population? And so there was a lot of attempts to, to do this. And um, some of the later review studies that six months or a year later look back on that initial uh, 2020 surge um, found out that um, it, it it really didn't do so well. There was um, a, uh, there was a problem with um, people coming in with what's called comorbidities or different not, uh, different sort of um, uh, symptoms and uh, health effects may maybe that had led to to a COVID infection that kind of threw things off. There were also different hospitals having different sorts of patient populations, um, you know, large urban uh, medical centers, rural clinics, uh, suburban um, dock in the box, you know, all these different places were getting uh, COVID patients. And so trying to pull all this data together and to have a big enough data set to train the algorithm, it was really difficult. Um, and it was a very fast moving epidemic as well, a fast moving virus and evolving virus. So I think folks have learned a lot from that. Um, and I think we'll see what happens you know, in the future and how they are able to take these algorithms and maybe do a planning for planning purposes, but, but maybe not for uh, this uh, fast diagnosis. What do you see are, you know, the potential challenges or, you know, even ethical challenges here about chat GPT being potentially used in healthcare one day? Sure. I mean, aside from the issue of plagiarism <laughs> in a medical license exam, um, I think there's a, there is an issue of accuracy. I think there's a lot of discussion and a lot of interest in commercial chatbots, for example, um, telehealth really gained a foothold during the pandemic, and, and that seems to be a place where um, the, the creators believe that uh, this is going, and also money will be flowing, there will be products coming out, 
and I think um, the thing is, we you know we, we want guardrails, <laughs> and and we don't quite have them yet. Yeah. Right. I think we need trustworthy chat GPT. That's mm -hmm. trustworthy AI is the uh, you know so what we are looking at because misinformation you know can can arise or, or you know incorrect information. So we need to constantly watch it and make sure uh, you know it, it doesn't do any any uh, harm. I think uh, in terms of the bias, we have to be careful. Uh, certain communities being left out. Um, certain. Uh, um, patient populations, minority uh, populations that um, either lack access to health care or are uh, somehow uh, have a history of discrimination for one reason or another, and that um, uh, may not be included in medical studies. We have one question about what are some other limits that exist for AI? Well, I like to say AI doesn't like surprises especially the way it is designed now using data. So it can only handle what has been seen, but there is a way out of that. We are now using more and more synthetic data, you know, so what is possible? And so that AI can be prepared or trained, uh, you know, to handle uh, things that have not happened, but could. You know, for example, you know, sensors can only capture what has happened, but imagination, right? You know, it, it is much more uh, varied and so forth. So. I think introducing more and more synthetic environments and so forth for training AI systems would be a good thing to do. So yeah, that's what I think is, is an exciting thing that might happen. Yep. The other limit is autonomy. Um, you know, creativity is one side, autonomy is another side where there are fears of autonomy of something called general AI. And, you know, right now AI really just exists in, in, in the data set where it lives or in the algorithm it lives. It's not going to jump from you know, one data set to another or, you know, infiltrate one set of computers to another. It's it's not really going to happen right now. And and I, well, we'll see what the future holds. But yeah. autonomy is one thing that people are really concerned about. And it, it just is not part of the discussion right now. Um, we have a question about um, whether you can speak to any specific hospital systems or healthcare companies or even private practices who are leading the pack in terms of implementing AI effectively and ethically. I think there are many examples right now. So um, I think there are small companies, for example, in the uh, initiative we have, uh, from National Institute of Aging, we are I identified about eight companies, you know, from our first year grant to promote, you know, AI research and then move products from labs to hospitals. But AI and medicine is going to be slow it, it, because it, it need, you know, we need to go through and make sure it, it works and everything, right? So it's going to take time, but I think as we see more and more uh, FDA approvals and so forth, uh, you will see it's integrated. It's not like you are going to have you know, AI is working here in, in hospital. Sometimes it may just be in the background, you know, with, with a better way of triaging, you know, people who come into um, uh, emergency and so forth. We have time for one more audience question here. There um, is a question about cybersecurity. So are there cybersecurity or data security concerns around a using AI tools in hospitals? I'm sure there are many. Um, Eric, why don't you take that one? Eric, why don't you take that one? Sure. I think there's been some concerns uh, in, in recent years about uh, internet connected devices, um, uh, you know, uh, heart monitors, health monitors, patient monitor sensors that, that uh, have an internet connection and, and, and that can be hacked. Um, I think you're probably going to see similar things uh, as AI sort of like Rama says, you know, becomes part of the background. Um, I think uh, anytime that you have large amounts of data that can be accessed, um, that you that, that the threats are there, and and you just need to have the same security precautions that we have had as we've gone to digital health in the past 15, 20 years. Thank you both again. Really great conversation. Thanks for having me on the show. Great to be here. Thank you. And that's it for today's tech news briefing. For more tech stories, check out our website, wsj.com. I'm Zoe Thomas for The Wall Street Journal. Thanks for listening.